Okay, I guess this is the time for us to start our Allegro Tech Live number five. Yeah, we're live on Facebook. So uh, this meetup will be held all in English. All presentations will be in English. So I hope you're gonna enjoy it. And welcome everyone on our fifth uh, Allegro Tech Live meetup. Uh, we've already uh, covered uh, Android programming, and now is the time to talk about iOS programming. So this is gonna be all about iOS. Um, and for those who are here for the first time, um, what is actually Allegro Tech Live? So we were trying to find a way to share our knowledge because we love sharing our knowledge as Allegro engineers uh, during the times of the quarantine. And not only to share the knowledge, but also to somehow uh, be able to show you the, the atmosphere, the, the energy of actually gathering uh, in one room in the office during physical meetup. So we've been thinking on how to, how to do all of this in a virtual setting. And this is how we came up with the Allergo Tech Live format. This is kind of a, well, if you merge an interview and a presentation, into one, you would get Allegro Tech Live. So what I'm doing is I'm kind of conducting interviews with my guests, uh, but they come prepared with their own slides. And actually they're trying, they're telling their own stories. And what's important uh, during all presentations, you're free to ask your questions in our Facebook uh, comments. And I'm actually gonna get those questions and I'm gonna ask them to our guests. So, you know, uh, the Q&A and the interaction is all here. Uh, afterwards, we uh, share Allegro Tech Live um, videos on YouTube. So they're accessible by anyone, every, anywhere. If Allegro Tech Live is not enough for you and you would like to, you know, get more knowledge from Allegro, uh, you can always visit our blog, blog uh, at allegro.tech, uh, which is full of material in English, also about mobile programming. And if your Polish is, well, great or good enough, you can listen to our podcast, which we uh, publish uh, weekly. And just last week, we published an episode uh, on front-end performance. And this Monday, another one about uh, programming in .NET in Allegro. So my name is Adam Dubiel, and I'm team manager in Allegro technical department. I've been in Aragro for seven years, uh, working in its great company. And my today, today's guests will be Camille Bozem, with whom I'm going, I'm going to talk about uh, ABI stability in Swift. Uh, Maciej Petrowski, which we're going we're gonna to do some digging in the code base, the code base archaeology talk. And Pavel Kowalczuk, uh, who's going to talk about uh, using uh, Redux principles in iOS programming. Each presentation is gonna last for about 30 minutes and we're gonna take five minutes, five-ish minute breaks uh, in between them. So let's start with Camille. Camille, from here. Hi, uh, Adam. Hi, everyone. Hi, Camille. So uh, what actually, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, who you are and what brings you here? Why do you wanna talk about, you know, ABI? Yeah, so I am an iOS developer at Allegro. I work uh, with the main like marketplace app of uh, Allegro. And uh, there is only one uh, thing that I like more than compiling. That's the compiling. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, the thing that I like most. Okay, so let's start to talk. Let's let's let, let me learn something about new about Swift. Okay, so let me uh, share my slides. Uh, can you see them? Yep, looks great. Okay, Adam. So first, uh, a question for you: Have you ever used Swift? Uh, actually, I wrote a simple, very simple web server in Swift once. I think I used Vapor or something. But it was like wow, that. that's that's great. So you technically know the syntax. Uh, so probably many iOS developers are watching uh, this presentation right now. But uh, for all the viewers not knowing Swift, 
uh, Swift is very intuitive and in many ways it is uh, very similar to Kotlin. Uh, also the ABI stability, the topic of my presentation, it's a highly language independent topic. So it applies to a lot of languages. So you can uh, basically think about Swift being used here just an example. So yeah, starting uh, talking about Swift. Swift has its own uh, block and some time ago, uh, like more than a year ago, Jordan Rose from uh, core team, uh, from Swift core team, wrote a post uh, describing binary compatibility. So ABI stability is uh, just a part of a bigger, of bigger picture. Uh, binary compatibility is much wider topic. And this uh, particular uh, article is great. You should definitely read it. I read it and uh, I felt it was uh, kind of too generic, too high level uh, for nerd like me. So I personally, I like to feel things, how they work inside. I like to understand them. So now I would like to show you uh, what this whole binary compatibility is, but I would like to do it in my way. So, so I guess you, you're really up to the challenge. Like if, if this kind of blog post is too generic for you, you really like to dig into things. Uh, yeah, and uh, we'll see if I uh, made myself clear, if you understand me. Uh, so, okay, so I'm a mobile newbie, so it's going to be interesting. Let's go. Okay, uh, this uh, binary compatibility consists of uh, three different topics. So the, the first one is ABI stability. Uh, it's actually the topic of this presentation, but I'm going to talk about uh, two different things, module stability and module evolution. Um, and I'm going to explain each topic uh, one by one. And uh, I will not start with definitions. Instead, I want all of you to like uh, feel the consequences and uh, let's uh, skip the definitions at uh, the very last. Okay, so I guess we're gonna write some code. Uh, yeah, exactly, or uh, some slide code. So um, here you can see an Xcode. It's basically most popular IDE for Swift on macOS. And uh, I actually created two Hello World projects. One is for macOS and one for iOS. And now we are going to talk about ABI stability. So I compiled those two projects first using uh, Swift, Swift compiler 4.2. Uh, and I get really huge applications. Those are just the Hello World applications. Then I compiled very same projects using uh, Swift 5. And as you can see, I got much smaller apps. So, so this is that. I don't, I don't know what ABI stability is yet, but I can see the pain. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, like, that's uh, just the uh, ob most obvious consequence of ab ABI stability, but uh, I will describe more stuff later. So obviously, uh, Swift uh, ABI stability uh, does the difference here. And as you can see, Swift 5 is the very first Swift with ABI stability for all Apple platforms. So Swift is not stable yet on Linux, but on iOS, macOS, uh, ABI is now stable. So we just compiled two sample apps. Let's just, uh, let's now try to decompile them to see the reasons of this uh, size difference. So we're basically going to use uh, an OTL. OTL is uh, like a standard uh, console utility for Ewing binary executables and libraries on macOS. And we're going to use this uh, L uh, parameter. Uh, we're going to display all load commands. What are those load commands? Uh, load commands are like 
instructions uh, for operating system how the app should be started is it just like a table of contents for a binary file so when you start the app operating system loads uh, those load commands and those load commands uh, contains a lot of different things for example dependent dynamic libraries and on the screen you can see some of those load commands and uh, those are like uh, requirements for operating system to load uh, like swift runtime libraries so this looks like really really uh, really innocent and just you know perfectly reasonable i would like to look yeah. this. yeah exactly and uh, there's a lot of different uh, things in those load commands and uh, I think you don't really need any manual for this because if using tools like all tool, uh, they all seem uh, self uh, describing. So, so I guess there's going to be something suspicious coming up. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but not, not yet here uh, because uh, those load commands look uh, exactly the same both for applications compiled uh, using Swift 4.2 and uh, Swift 5. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, those paths start with uh, this macro, air path. Air path stands for runtime search path. And it's basically resolved by uh, the OS when uh, application starts. So operating system have some default value for, for this but your application can suggest uh, different uh, different like path to search all the dependencies and uh, for application compiled with swift 4.2 there is another load command that uh, suggests the air path and this air path is just a framework directory inside the application and yeah, that's exactly what uh, all iOS developers as expected uh, now, probably, mm, because frameworks is by convention, it contains all third party libraries and uh, also Swift uh, runtime uh, libraries in this case. But uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, let's see our path for Swift 5 uh, application. And yeah, this looks uh, different. Uh, it's the difference that you uh, were asking for. So now the frameworks directory is a second AirPath su suggestion. The first one is uh, a system directory. So this directory is a location of a ABI stable Swift, uh, Swift bundled within the operating system. So either iOS or macOS. So it seems that, that uh, starting with Swift 5, ABI stable Swift, all newer versions of Swift uh, are going to be distributed with the OS. So what, what does it mean? That means if we compiled application with Swift 5 and we wait uh, uh, some time for, to upgrade our system, then our Swift 5 application could uh, get run with Swift 6 runtime and it should just work. So yeah, the Isn't this frame... asking yourself for trouble, like, you know, something might break in the future? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, something could break. So you, you should take some measurements to avoid uh, that things breaking. Uh, so regarding the app size, uh, as for uh, this uh, application compiled with Swift 5, frameworks directory doesn't contain uh, the Swift runtime libraries. So that's what makes the difference in the app size. But what is wrong with Swift 4 and Swift 5 runtime? Why, why isn't Swift 4 uh, distributed as part of the OS? So now let's try something really crazy and irresponsible and uh, please don't uh, do it in your in your own home we are going to copy just copy swift 5.1 uh, runtime from my macOS catalina just into the app compiled with swift 4.2 and 
what do you think is going to happen? Well, the, the image is, you know, suggesting not good. Nothing is yeah. going to happen. <laughs> yeah, so operating system, it didn't blow, but it failed to start the application. Uh, the dynamic uh, loader, which starts all the applications, it just failed to find some symbol. The, the symbol was expected uh, in Swift core library, but the symbol is missing. Uh, let's try to use uh, Swift uh, tool chain uh, tooling uh, to understand uh, what uh, is the symbol about. So, so we are so doing. It, will, it, it means that basically there's some you know breaking change in the in, in how it behaves. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So like there is an unexpected uh, difference, and wh what's exactly uh, that difference? Uh, this symbol, uh, when we demangle it, demangle it, uh, we can see that uh, it's some like uh, helpful structure for unknown object type. So, why is this unknown object missing? Uh, Swift is open source, so if you try to search for uh, this unknown object, you will see that. Uh, this unknown object type was removed in Swift 5. So, as you, as you said, application compiled with Swift uh, 4.2 uses that type, but uh, Swift 5.1 runtime doesn't have it. So, yeah, that, that's the problem. And now we can finally tell the definition, uh, what is an ABI? ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. It's kind of interface of or contract between uh, two things, between two programs, two two modules. Uh, yeah, and I so, I think so. Basic, so basically, what I had is I had a, like a executable in Swift, and then I had some other pre-compiled uh, pre-compiled library, and whatever they tried to talk with each other, they couldn't because of a difference in the ABI. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Swift uh, just announced that uh, it's ABI uh, for Darwin platforms. So for iOS, macOS became stable. So that means a lot. Uh, that, basically, that basically means that uh, ABI, Swift ABI will not change in a breaking way, just like that. Uh, so for example, regarding data layout, so actual uh, layout in the of, in the memory of uh, classes structures enums it's now going to a part uh, of contract it cannot change uh, swift uh, like runtime functions memory memory management uh, yeah they will have to stay uh, swift is not a library so ara is dictionaries uh, yeah that be, that stuff can be modified but you should expect only non-breaking modifications. But uh, yeah, that, that's, that image uh, may feel wrong. Uh, I, I, mm, I don't feel it's a trade-off. It's, it's a major thing uh, and Swift community was targeting for that for a very long time. And mm, why uh, was the Swift unstable before? because it allowed uh, the language to evolve really fast. So uh, probably everybody uh, using Swift remembers how Swift changed drastically over uh, first years of this language. So now when Swift has uh, like a solid foundation, ABI can be just stabilized. So basically, this is like a point in time at which Swift became a mature language and you can actually have some meaningful or like, you know, expectations regarding how it's going to evolve and that you're not going to wake up one day and just find that your app is not working. Yeah, actually, Swift, uh, I think, became very stable uh, in Swift uh, 4. Uh, we, we haven't uh, seen uh, major changes till then. Uh, this declaration of ABI stability is like a, uh, mm, how, how to say that? I, I think somehow uh, Swift was ready to be stable. It just was 
a public declaration. Somebody just had to set that. So uh, I wouldn't say that Swift uh, became mature by that, but it was a declaration of uh, maturity that was already like uh, true. Yeah, like a turning point in history. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that closes the first uh, part, the ABI stability. Let's uh, talk about module stability. So uh, again, you can see an Xcode and I created a sample framework. And uh, framework, uh, it's probably something unique for uh, Apple platforms. Framework is a container for dynamic library and its resources. It's like a standard way to uh, provide uh, the dynamic libraries uh, on Apple platforms. So I created this framework and as you can see, it provides uh, pseudo random number generator uh, yeah and uh, that's an mvp it shows a major problem with all random number generators you can uh, never be sure whatever they are random or not uh, but yeah that is sufficient for this presentation let's compile it and let's take a look into compiled uh, framework so uh, compiled framework contains uh, like a directory structure and there is uh, a thing called Swift module. So uh, this Swift module, basically it uh, describes public interface of framework to be used by uh, IDE for code completion, uh, public interface for compiler, for doing linking, stuff like that. Uh, so what's inside this file? And well, nothing, uh, readable by humans. Swift module is a binary file. Uh, we can see only hex dump here. And we, if we Google uh, this file, uh, we can read that Swift module file contains serialized AST. AST stands for abstract syntax tree. So structure directly used uh, by the compiler during the compilation process. So we can't uh, read it uh, this way by we can actually display uh, that uh, AST using this nifty command. Uh, as you can see, I just have to run Swift using top secret, deprecated, integrated, interactive uh, shell. Uh, so yeah, that seems already great. And after executing uh, print, print module command, uh, we get like a public description of framework interface. And it worked because uh, I used the very same version of Swift, which was used to compile that framework. Uh, why am I talking about this? Because uh, probably all Swift developers uh, here listening probably um, knows uh, this kind of problem when Xcode fails to import a framework uh, compiled with different version of Swift. So it's like a uh, very no obstacle with using frameworks, Swift frameworks. It was compiled with different Xcode, so I just won't, won't use it. That's the, that used to be the Xcode way. Uh, so basically you had to download a proper version of the library compiled with the proper version of Swift to, to make it work. Uh, yeah, uh, or download the source code and re recompile, yeah. So let's replicate uh, that thing in this uh, interactive shell. So I'm going to switch uh, Swift version of my operating system to a different version. And after running the very same commands, uh, you can see that uh, I get an error, but uh, yeah, and error is basically the same uh, thing that in Xcode, uh, framework compiled with different Swift version. Uh, but um, you reading this error and being programmer, you can probably uh, guess that there is some if instruction in the Swift compiler that prevents uh, for uh, from the code doing its stuff. So we are not going to the compile, uh, compiler but we can do a little trick. Uh, we can open the Swift, uh, Swift module uh, file using uh, hex editor 
and there is an information about the version of Swift that was used to compile this framework. So uh, we can just change uh, that numbers to numbers matching uh, toolchain on our OS. So I've done that and can you imagine what's going to happen? Well, uh, I would suspect it would work. Why not? If the, the modules are actually compatible, unless they're not. Uh, yeah, it's probably, uh, yeah, that's a good reasoning. But uh, what actually happens, it isn't just a regular kind of uh, like error or something. It's like a crazy malloc error and uh, you cannot even understand what's going on. But why did that happen? That happened because uh, compiler uh, AST format changes across different Swift uh, versions. And uh, this, this Swift version knows AST format for just for this uh, version of Swift. And test framework has totally different uh, format of AST. So it seems that using uh, AST as a Mm, like interface description is not very good, uh, good idea or at least not very portable one. But uh, there is a new option in Xcode 11 and Swift uh, 5.1. Um, build libraries for distribution flag. And uh, this option basically enables this module stability. So uh, let's turn it uh, on and let's take a look into the framework. And as you can see, uh, yeah, there is there is a new file inside uh, the framework Swift interface, and it's a text file. So let's display it. As you can see, it contains uh, like uh, interface description in a Swifty like uh, way. So it's very it, familiar. It looks, more, it looks more or less like the thing that you got from the REPL shell before, like you know. Totally human readable. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, exactly. You you are right. So yeah, th this is uh, the file which allows any new version of uh, Xcode to understand this uh, framework. So after enabling uh, module stability, you no longer have to uh, like match the Swift version of your libraries. You can reuse uh, the library in uh, any version of uh, Xcode. And uh, yeah, uh, so comparing this to the ABI stability, ABI stability allows different Swift versions in the runtime and module stability allows different Swift versions during development. So that uh, closes this topic. Do, do you know uh, what was the reason behind using AST instead of this kind of interface from the start? I think uh, because Swift was evolving really fast, I think uh, nobody had time uh, to do this properly. And uh, there was a lot of more important uh, stuff. And I, I think uh, like the code base of, uh, or th there, there were not a lot of uh, existing libraries and nobody had a problem uh, to uh, like, published source code of their libraries. So people were just recompiling uh, code. And uh, now I think it might change. Okay. Yeah. Sounds so uh, I'm not really sure how uh, much time more uh, we have, but uh, it's time for the last topic. Uh, it will take more, more or less uh, 10 minutes. So Mm, library evolution, I think. Bit. Okay, library evolution, I think it's the most interesting uh, topic uh, from among these uh, three topics. On the screen, you can see a game implemented in Swift. It's an MVP of Mario Bros. game. So uh, this whole uh, like application is developed by two teams of people. First, the uh, team develops a characters library. Uh, you can see the whole source code uh, in the bottom panel, so it's a class with some methods. And second team uh, develops mine application, and this team uses results uh, of uh, 
of first team work. So it just imports the characters library. And Adam, what do you think? Uh, what will this program print if run? Um, so I'm just using Mario Jump. I don't, I'm not an expert in Swift, but well, it will just print Jump, why not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's going to print <laughs> Jump string, but this was just a warm up. So let's uh, create a little modification here. Uh, let's now imagine that second team improves the characters library. It adds a new functionality. So as you can see, there's a new method, fire, which allows Mario to throw a fireball. And uh, they also did some bug fixing in this library. Uh, but uh, team number one, they went for vacations or something like that. So product owner decides that uh, the uh, first team is going to recompile the library and just replace that library inside compiled app. So we are not going to compile main, uh, main executable once again, just going to reuse the old one, which is going to replace the framework. And yeah, what uh, do you think, Adam? Is it going to work or not? So, uh, so since you're asking the question, I would say that there's probably, it's not using like the names, it's using some kind of a symbols. And since if I added fire at the end of the file, it would probably work. But since it's at the beginning, like, you know, taking the place of jump, like zero, one, two, it's probably gonna do fire or, you know, it's not gonna work the way it should. Oh, we are the first uh, person that uh, actually gets the correct uh, answer. So on any attempt uh, to jump, uh, the Mario is going to throw a fireball. So the question is uh, why? And the answer is FBI, uh, but not this FBI. In computing, FBI stands for Fragile Binary Interface. Uh, so now I will explain you this, uh, this problem. Uh, so this is a human perspective of Mario Bros game. It's a source code, uh, think for human. So first the main game, then the characters library on the bottom. And in the main game, there is an invocation of method. This invocation is done by uh, the method's name. Uh, now let's see a Swift runtime perspective. And now we have a class with numbered methods, method zero, method one, method two, and the main app just invokes the method at index one. So uh, if I might say, it, it probably looks, uh, I probably guessed it because it looks very much the same in Java and when you, you use bytecode and, you know, look behind the curtain. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's actually, uh, make uh, my first words true that, uh, this stuff is like language agnostic and true for uh, a lot of platforms. So uh, yeah. is it also called a vtable mechanism in Java? Yep. yep exactly. Okay. You can so, actually see it in flame graphs, like, you know, when you do performance, you can see the vtable calls. Oh, nice. So uh, if uh, I encourage all of the viewers to visit uh, Allegro Tech blog to read the uh, post about uh, yeah, Swift method dispatching, but it's basically about uh, V tables. So uh, it would be great uh, even if you don't use Swift every day. Uh, yeah, so not, now let's replicate that uh, previous modification. Let's add a, fray, uh, a fire method. So as you can see, we added uh, method at index one and all other methods were shifted uh, by one. So, uh, sorry, uh, okay. Uh, as, you, as you can see, the main application still tries to invoke uh, the method using the uh, index, index one, but index one now is index of totally different uh, unexpected method. So this explains why the fire method was uh, invoked. And uh, in this version of Swift that I used, as, as you can see, uh, the order of methods in the table directly corresponds to order of methods in the source code. Uh, 
this should not happen in a mature language. So how to prevent uh, that limitation? We just need to activate, uh, again, we just need to activate uh, the Spring library evolution. So it can be done by basically saying, uh, basically turning on the, the same flag that was used uh, for module stability, build libraries for distribution. And now let's see from the runtime perspective, how uh, does the compiler uh, generate support for that library evolution? As you can see, there's one additional function. It's called dispatch punk. And mine executable no longer uh, uses the table indexes. It just calls the dispatch uh, func function. It's just as simple, as straight as calling the gro global function. It's as simple as uh, go to, uh, as jumping into address. Uh, the question is how the main executable knows the memory address of this, uh, of this function. So uh, operating system finds uh, all addresses and just connects the dots when the app starts. So as you can see, dispatch func still uses the tables, but uh, now there is one important difference. Dispatch func is within the library. So when you change anything, when you add a new method inside the Mario, uh, the compiler will just regenerate this dispatch func. And here I added a new method fire and uh, while compiling, compiler will generate dispatch func with the very same name. So my application will just uh, call that, uh, but vtable index will be updated to two. So the game is going to work as expected. But adding uh, some functions, will it not lead to some kind of a bloat of your binary and you know, a lot of complexity? Yeah, so that's probably an issue uh, with uh, like uh, applications targeting for high performance. So you can opt in, opt out for that uh, behavior. But I think majority of apps uh, wouldn't uh, even uh, like feel the difference. Um, but I haven't checked uh, whatever the library size uh, is going to uh, grow. I think I should check that, uh, but now I am not really sure. So yeah, that's basically from... That's, that's, that's great in anyway. Okay, so that's from the compiler uh, perspective. Uh, tell me, Adam, do we have like a three, four more, more minutes? I wanted to show you the <laughs> assembly of the dispatch bank. If you want to dive in into the CPU and assembly language anytime. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, anyone uh, who doesn't know assembly, I will explain uh, line by line how does the dispatch funk uh, works. It's very short and yeah, I think we can, uh, we can do that. We are just going to drop uh, some lines because they are not interesting. Uh, particularly each uh, function uh, begins uh, with prolog and with and ends with epilog. Let's just drop them and let's just concentrate all on those uh, three instructions. Uh, they are like the core of the dispatch func. So we are going to like step by step uh, describe uh, each of those instructions and we are going to use this memory uh, diagram as a helper. So yeah, let's start. Uh, this R14 is a CPU register. It holds a dispatch func argument. So as you can remember, dispatch func uh, got as a first argument, um, re like a pointer to the Mario object. So R14 is just a pointer to some object. And in the very first line, uh, dispatch func retrieves values stored at the beginning of the Mario object. So this is like, uh, the, the, um, this corresponds to, uh, if, if you wanted to implement that in C language, this is how it would look like. So yeah, this instruction takes value at the, uh, at the beginning of the object. This value is a pointer to a metadata class. So after this instruction, metadata pointer is stored 
into Rux register. So Rux register now points to the metadata. Now uh, the second uh, line, second instruction, it's very similar except uh, that offset. So this offset is uh, uh, like uh, this corresponds, uh, this hits directly into the V table. V table is a part of metadata. So you can think uh, like uh, offset uh, 50, uh, 58 just uh, corresponds to the method at index one, uh, pointer to the method. So in this instruction, CPU is going to take this pointer, pointer to like the pure assembly, and is going to put that pointer into the Rax register. And at the end, it's uh, just very simple. It's just uh, calling the function by, uh, by its address. So uh, dispatch func is just going to call uh, implementation of Mario Jump. So I hope you did uh, get it. I tried uh, my best, but yeah, there is a lot of magic here. So in case you don't believe me, it's all true then you can uh, check it yourself. Just put a breakpoint in the jump method and run the game. And the dispatch punk is going to be visible in the stack trace. So if anyone ever asks you what is a dispatch punk, then you can just tell them that it protects Mario from FBI. From fire. And uh, we actually got a question uh, on Facebook. So uh, the question is, is there any way to avoid the issue you showed by changing method dispatch type to static or used uh, struct or final class? Um, yeah, so uh, change, uh, first part of the question uh, is about changing dispatch uh, type to static. So um, yeah, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, really, I'm not really sure, but I think it should address uh, that feature. I think that uh, static dispatch generates uh, like a, um, symbols in Marco file and probably those uh, symbols uh, just connects uh, to the right places. So I would uh, have to check that because I'm not uh, really sure. Uh, and the second part of the question was? And the second part of the question was, uh... Uh, or use struct or final class. Uh, can, okay, can it so be avoided by using structs or final classes. Yeah, so using structs and final classes basically uh, somehow um, makes uh, the direct use of struct makes uh, the dispatch uh, static if you don't use protocols. Uh, but I, I am not. I am also not sure. I, I haven't checked that. Uh, because I, I wonder uh, whatever uh, methods get, uh, still uh, get macro symbols, uh, struct methods, or if they are just reference like a part of the struct. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure if uh, I will uh, check uh, who, who asked that question and after the presentation, I uh, yeah, you can just contact. post a comment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can just post a comment on Facebook later on. So. That's perfectly fine for us. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I got one more slide. It's just a reminder to visit uh, Allegro Tech. Uh, we have a lot of interesting articles uh, there. And uh, yes, yeah, some more uh, links about uh, ABI stability for from Swift. And yeah, that's uh, all I had to say. So thank you, Adam, for having me. And <laughs> thanks everyone for watching. In case you had any questions, uh, you don't want to ask them now, uh, I will try to read them in comments. Yeah, so you can you can visit our tech blog to read Camille's, uh, Camille's articles. You can actually move on from them straight to our job postings because we are looking for iOS developers. And actually, there's going to be an episode with Camille of Alrecord Tech podcast coming out very soon. 
uh, his Camille talks uh, about uh, how we actually develop our iOS application. <laughs> so it's an interesting, interesting thing to listen. I already did. So whenever it comes public, I hope you will too. So once again, Camille, thank you for, for your presentation, for your time. And this is going to be a break time for us. So we're going to have like five minutes break. Uh, I'm going to post, uh, uh, I'm going to just share my screen and post a, uh, yep, yeah, and, and put up the, uh, the banner. So we're going to start at four to seven. So 18.56. Yep. So have a nice break and uh, see you see you after it. And we're going to talk about you know code archaeology with Machi. So see you soon. See you in five minutes.
Okay, so it's time to go for, for another presentation. So uh, with Camille, we dug deep into the Swift internals and with Maciej, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna dug, but you know, into, into the past, into, uh, we're gonna get back in time. We see code archeology. span So Maciej, uh, hello there, how are you? And what brings you here? Who are you actually? Like, what are you doing? Here. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm an iOS developer. Surprise, surprise. However, I do not develop features for the main Allegro application, not at the moment. So I work in a team that develops tools that make other developers' life much easier. So for example, uh, I work on a tool that generates new frameworks, new modules for our application. Uh, our team also deals with speeding up compilation time and generation of Xcode projects for different modules. So we're basically doing uh, tools for developers to make their lives easier. Okay, so I, I guess I guess both Pavel and Kamil can actually attest to this that you're making their lives easier. I hope <laughs> we so. Cannot yeah. see that. <laughs> Okay, so what brings you here? What, what about what archaeology has to do with uh, with making people life easier? Uh, yeah, maybe it doesn't have much uh, to making other developers' life easier. However, let me share uh, slides first because I need to set everything up. Uh, can you see now a white screen with some? Yep. Uh, yep. Okay. Old archaeology. Yeah. So that. let me just share screen uh, presentation slides i think okay, you should be able to see the see. presentation mode uh, can you or not presentation, presentation mode, mode? Uh, so presentation mode, no. namely uh we're all good or you can or you see something else because i can't see zoom output so you should be seeing not the presenter notes but presentation slides were you able to see them or something else. No, no we actually no. saw the, the presentation. Okay, mode. no, I get it. So, so I must have shared the wrong screen. No problem, not a problem. So actually, uh, for a few years, I've been leading teams which helped build backend services. So we built kind of a tools for backend developers. So I think I actually know how you feel working in your role. And I also know that it takes a lot of uh, experience to be able to, you know, build this kind of tools. Uh, and this experience comes with uh, with time and also with uh, with uh, with seeing a lot of weird things in your life. So uh, I guess the archaeology is about seeing those weird things. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is, especially when you work with legacy code bases uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, let me ask the question. Can you see the proper presentation? Yeah, now it's great. Yeah, yeah now, great. Now it looks great. Okay, so uh, let's begin. I already told you that I don't work on the Allegro application itself, but I have a passion for iOS development. And prior to, my, to beginning my journey with Allegro, I worked on a messaging application. Uh, unfortunately, this project, product is no longer available on App Store, uh, but working with this code base was, yeah, we struggled a lot, uh, the, the whole team, because it was a complicated project and it was also a great experience and great opportunity to learn from it. Uh, so for you just to have a glimpse of what we had to deal with, the largest view controller in the application had 8,000 lines of code. So I ended up being sticked to the computer for quite a long time because I needed to understand how things were supposed to work. Uh, and yeah, I basically were, was programming new features to the application. And be, so uh, before, yeah. Th this is why the code folding was invented because you had to deal with 8,000 files. Yeah, exactly. Files. This is why they invented it for, yeah. <laughs> Uh, before I wanted to uh, become a professional programmer, I had different dreams. When I was a child, uh, I wanted to become an Egyptologist. 
an Egyptologist and Egyptology uh, is the study of the language, history, and culture of ancient Egypt. And when I compare being a programmer and being an Egyptologist, I think these two aren't that different. For example, uh, Egyptologists uh, read this script of ancient Egyptians, and it was called hieroglyphs. And I think iOS developers had also very difficult script to read, and it was called Objective C. And this inscription here is written in Objective C, and it's actually the agenda for the presentation. So I'm going to take you to an archaeological dig, and I'm going to tell you two stories from uh, my experience while working on the messaging application. I will go down through the pyramid of doom I had to uh, go through. I will also tell you what I found in this pyramid, how I preserved artifacts, and I will also try to explain to you how to avoid traps that code base can uh, set on you. So basically, we're going to start the Indiana Jones experience now. Yeah, sort of. So. Uh, when I worked for this company, I wasn't working alone. So I uh, tapped into pair programming. So pair programming is basically two developers doing the same job, right? Yeah, not at sounds all. like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. So basically you have two devs sitting in front of one computer, having connected to displays, to mice and to keyboards. And for the majority of time, while doing pair programming, developers talk to each other, trying to come up with the best solution for the problem. It's like a continuous code review process. Uh, this picture here shows uh, my teammate. I worked with this guy on the left. His name was Tai. He was Vietnamese. And uh, when I joined the company, I worked uh, with him for quite a long time. And I worked in the setup every single day for eight hours for 17 months. And I must admit, it's the best way of doing coding I have ever had in my lifetime. So if you would be able to try it out, I strongly recommend performing pair programming at your workplaces. When I joined this company, one of my very first tasks was to update the UI of a chat bubble, of a message bubble. And I needed to update it uh, with time for a few message types. And we also needed to introduce a new message bubble uh, to the UI. So there's a new message type we needed to display a text for. When we dug into message cell, which corresponded to a chat bubble displayed on the user interface, we were thrilled. So there was this message cell with attributed string for message method. And it would give us on the output an NS attributed string. And in order to create this NS attributed string based on a message properties, uh, it would have to execute through 238 lines of code. So there was this huge switch statement that spanned uh, through 238 lines of code. And it would have multiple if and switch statements interlaced and nested inside of it. And it was really painful to look at it. I told so you that's you, why the cold folding was invented. Yeah. It's not painful now. You, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't when you folded the code. However, if you unfolded it, you would see something similar to a pyramid. So for those of you who worked in the early days of Swift, you would remember that there was this concept of a pyramid of doom in order to unwrap multiple optionals, you would create this nested pyramid of if let statements. Uh, and yeah, we needed to go through this pyramid of doom, so to speak. And during work on this 
task, we also settled the foundation of this new brand new science called ethology. And this was the science of how if and switch statements work. So let me rephrase the task we actually had to, to uh, work on. We need to understand how things worked, first of all. Uh, we needed to change the existing logic of the application and we couldn't break things because this was application that was live to many, many people, to many, many people. And when so working... I, hmm? I, yeah, I suspect that uh, anyone who wrote this kind of an if hell, he didn't need to write tests for this. <laughs> uh, I mean, writing tests doesn't make any harm. <laughs> And I will tell you something about it uh, later on. Uh, but I can assume that people just were putting stuff into it without even looking what was already there. We uh, had a few obstacles while working with this code. Obviously, code was super old, like five or seven years old. Uh, there was no documentation nor were there any unit tests. And actually, no one knew how things were supposed to work. So uh, the company I worked for uh, bought a license to further develop the project that another company uh, kicked off. And the initial company outsourced the work to contracting company. So we, we didn't even, we couldn't speak to people who initially worked on this project because obviously they weren't part of our company either. So we're doomed. And what can you do in such a situation? Uh, of course, you can run out of the office immediately and quit your job, but this is not what we did. You can delete the code and rewrite it from scratch, but good luck with doing it every time you had to uh, implement to add new features on top of something else already built. And what you can also do is you can preserve the knowledge that you gathered while working with this code and you can add new functionality on top of that. Ancient Egyptians had this concept of mummification and they saw the preservation of the body after life, sorry, after death, as an important step to living well in the afterlife. And in my opinion, programmers should see the preservation of the code with unit tests as an important step to verify that code worked correctly through its entire lifetime. So we preserved whatever we found in the code base after our archeological dig uh, through unit tests. So basically we prepared for our unit tests, different message types, and we wrote tests for these different message types. We would call methods, attributed string for a message on this message cell, and we would extract attributed string out of it, and it would verify that it had uh, properties, desired properties. And uh, every test would consist of three phases. In the first one, in the range phase, we would create this message with certain type and text. In the act phase, we would call the method that we wanted to test on a message cell, which was attributed string for a message. Out of the call to this method, we would get an artifact and we would assert certain properties on the artifact, as said earlier. And these characteristics, these properties asserted would be font, color, and etc. And why we did it? We did it because we wanted to get rid of this huge uh, pyramid of doom inside. We wanted to decouple things, uh, make things easier, and make, make them more readable. And unit tests allowed, uh, allow us to do that. 
And we also shifted the logic from the UI component, which was our UI table view cell subclass. Uh, we shifted it from there to a view model. And so thanks to this, yeah. So, uh, go on, go on. so how, how did you deal with, uh, you know, the multitude of those tests? So did you actually like, you know, uh, created inputs randomly and, you know, somehow preserved it? Or did you write those test cases by hand, like for each? Uh, so, you know, if you have a um, finite amount of message types, you can just, uh, yeah, copy and paste tests and uh, just change different attributes in it like the type or a font or a color and it works for us but there are also different parts of um, of the code base that we needed to take different approach on them on it and in these set of tests we would just uh, generate things maybe not randomly but we had sort of a generator of the input because we wanted to uh, perform sort of a, uh, what is it called? Like we wanted to have a different, uh, I just forgot the, <laughs> the name in English. Like a variety of inputs. Com yeah, 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 exactly. Like we needed to do some sort of a combinatorics between input to, uh, you know, uh, have a like different a matrix, set of Like a testing matrix or something. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Okay, great. So and by no taking this approach, yeah, we didn't encounter any doom. Uh, so unit testing uh, is a good idea on how to work with uh, legacy code bases. There is also another task I wanted to tell you about. And let's dig a bit more into the code base. And there are some interesting things you may find in very old code bases. So my pair mate, Thai, the Vietnamese guy I told you about in the beginning, at the beginning of the presentation, we were shifted from the UI team to the performance team after one or two months because we we're performing so well, obviously. And we needed to improve the performance of the application. We had to improve the cold start of the app. And the cold start is measured since the, uh, since the entrance of application did finish launching with options method till the time in which the first view controller appears on the screen. And we needed to find an entry point to this application. And it was also cumbersome because when we opened the appdelegate.m file, which con, uh, contained the code for application delegate, which is an entry point to the application. We had to scroll through multiple imports of different uh, header files. There would be this private interface of AppDelegate and somewhere in the middle, we would have, in the middle of the file, we would have application that finish launching with options methods that we craved for so much. And what we immediately noticed was that uh, start of the measurement of application called start was somewhere in the middle of the function. <laughs> so yeah, it happens sometimes. Uh, so we shifted it immediately to the top of the function where it belongs. Right, by, to. By, by doing so, you destroyed all the performance. Like, you know, probably uh, yeah. the graphs went crazy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> but we wanted to improve it even more. So this is why we did it. And we also wanted to have correct metrics gathered. And another thing that we found in this code base was that uh, there was this singleton of UI application used. UI application is the object that corresponds to the, uh, to your application, basically. Uh, but an application that finished launching with options method, you get this object as an input to the method. And I think this is a good idea to do Indiana Jones style uh, explanation. So what dependency injection is, Imagine that, that we have a burial necklace, a golden burial necklace that was created by Egyptians to open sarcophagus. And if we had to describe this object 
in terms of classes or structs, basically in code, uh, would create description with protocols. Uh, and what we could immediately, immediately see on this object is that it consists of multiple pieces glued together. And every piece of this burial necklace of this object can be described uh, by means of its properties and shapes. So basically characteristics of every uh, piece in this object can be described in terms of protocols. And when we have uh, these pieces described by protocols, when we know their shapes, we can extract a piece of it, of this burial necklace, and we can put actually in anything that matches the shape described by the protocol. So dependency injection, in my opinion, can be thought of as uh, putting anything that matches the protocol, the interface. And there are a few ways of injecting dependencies into your code. You can do it through property assignment. You can put stuff into an initializer of an object or a structure. You can also put stuff into an object through argument of a function. There's also this concept of dependency containers that your app, uh, from which your application uses uh, objects that do certain stuff such as networking or writing uh, to the disk and so on. And there's also this concept of running your application within some context or within some world over which you can gain control at unit test runtime. So how dependency injection looks like while you're running unit tests. So basically you have this description of an object and you create a stubbed version of the dependency and you put the stub version into the real object and you perform unit testing. I don't think it ended so well for Indiana Jones in that scene. It wasn't so easy. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, life is not easy as well, life of a programmer. So we, we also, it, but, but yeah, let's uh, wait for the, for the end of this movie. And I will tell you how it ended for us. So coming back to dependency injection, uh, you can inject stuff through a property. So imagine we had a class for a burial necklace that would have this snake property snake property would be of snake type, which is a protocol. Uh, by default, you would have it assigned to a certain value. And while running unit tests, you could assign your own implementation of a snake protocol. Uh, you can also initialize an object with certain uh, objects. So this is another way of injecting dependencies. We have initializer with, with left and right wing, and we would put our stub versions of wing objects uh, while running unit tests. And there's also a case in which you can uh, put arguments through argument of a function. So the necklace could have a resurrect function and it would tag a dead object. And while running unit tests, uh, you would just put your own implementation into it. And this was also the case uh, of application finish launching with options. So you get this argument application, and of course you can use it uh, in the execution, implementation of the method. And while executing unit tests, you could provide your stub version of the application to verify that uh, the function did what it was supposed to do in the first place. So this uh, piece of code that I showed you could be considered a code smell. And code smells are places in code which are of debatable quality. But I think this is an offensive term and we wanted to spread positive energy within the team, so we used name code fragrances. So let me show you a few more 
code fragrances that we found over there. So comments were uh, everywhere. They would span multiple lines. And there were places marked with can't touch this lines. So if you have some places that shouldn't be touched in your code base, I think the best option is to write unit tests for those places and verify in those uh, tests that parts of code won't change over time. You can also find comments which aren't useful. So for example, here we have a NS local initialized with identifier. The identifier is NUS and somebody has put this uh, very useful comment that it was US English local. Surprise, surprise. So avoid comments whenever possible. And my suggestion is to use unit testing to comment code and to verify that it work, works as desired. Another code fragrance that you can find are singletons. And how to approach them? You can use dependency injection uh, through property assignment to just extract those singletons to properties. And at unit test runtime, you just provide your own versions of components and you can perform assertions on those components, on stopped components. In the code base, we also had this core component. And this inscription here shows how to implement a singleton in Objective-C. And this core com component had perform operations methods and somewhere in the line 759, it would call its own singleton, method on its own singleton. But of course, it was a, an instance method. So be aware that such things can also happen in legacy code bases. And you should be calling, when you're within an instance method, you should be calling a method on self, not on the singleton of the class. And when it comes to singletons, there's also a similar subject that you can find within legacy code bases, which, are, which is usage of class methods. And how can you test these code frag fragrances? Uh, you need to create instance method with the same interface. You need to create a singleton of the component. And to maintain code compatibility, interface compatibility, you need to maintain the old uh, class function. But in the implementation of this function, you just call a method on a singleton you have just created. And by using this approach, you can extract uh, components to properties and verify that certain methods were called uh, on those components. So just a reminder, in my opinion, we, the developers, should see the preservation of the code with unit tests as an important step to verify that code works correctly through its entire lifetime. While working on this task, we used different approach to unit testing. So in the first case, it was input output tests. They were input output tests. And here we would cre uh, create different dependencies that we would use uh, in the application to finish launching with options method on application delegate. And in every unit test, we would verify that certain interactions between objects took place. A sample test would uh, require us to arrange an application stub, which is a parameter of application to finish launching with options method. In the act phase, we would call the aforementioned method. And in the assert phase, we would verify that methods on certain components had certain call counts. Do you know why we used call counts and not a Boolean value? Hmm. I have no idea, actually. I mean, because if it was like two counts, it probably would be a mistake and some side effect you wouldn't like to see in your code. 
Yeah, and actually we saw a few components being called a few times and they would do some network, heavy network calls or some input output writing to a disk. And we wanted to catch it. So we wanted every component to be called exactly one time because uh, in the end we wanted to improve the performance. It wasn't just writing unit tests per se. We did it so we uh, gained full control over the code and for full knowledge on how the code behaved because it was a huge method with many <laughs> other method calls and we wanted to uh, decouple things and make them so easier. Basic, basically in such a huge code base, in such a huge method, method this was kind of a way for you to perform so-called like architectural tests as a side effect of unit tests. So you would, you know, as you said, you could have total control over the art, kind of an architecture. So how many times you call all those things? Yeah, exactly. And we're also able to shift, um, shift uh, logic into other components and we could, uh, we could clean up things, right? Simplify them. So it's sort of working on an architecture as well. And this approach, of course, paid off for us. So this Indiana Jones story ends well. Uh, we maintained the logic. Uh, we got rid of redundant calls. We did code refactoring, which we uh, weren't be able to do if we hadn't had uh, full coverage of unit tests. And we achieved the goal. In the end, the performance was improved. So what's the takeaway? from this pre presentation, like how to avoid quicksands and traps of the legacy code base. I think uh, the takeaway begins with changing the concept of what legacy code is. So if you perceive legacy code as every piece of code that is not covered by unit tests, uh, you can escape the quicksands because everything you write today becomes legacy code tomorrow or the second you forget what the code was supposed to do. And to escape the quicksand that you may have set on yourself, your future self, first of all, you need to avoid singletons. That's the, another takeaway. You need to use dependency injection to make code testable. So you should get, uh, you should create some seams in your application, extract stuff to properties and just allow dependency injection to happen. And you also uh, should document your code with unit tests because it will make your life easier in the future because you will have this freedom of changing your code without being afraid that things might might get broken. So my approach would be uh, using TDD every day. So writing tests first, then the implementation, and then working on the simpler solution, like refactoring the code. Uh, so to sum up, uh, if you ever went to the code base, it went to work on a code base that there are no unit tests, no documentation, and actually you would be afraid of touching any uh, line of code. You would feel as if you were going through a sandstorm. And this picture here shows a sandstorm that went through Egypt in 2012. And yeah, you can imagine the experience, like everything is super blurry and you can't get through with the work. Uh, when you write unit tests for your code base, you make reality uh, less blurry. You preserve information on how your code works and you save time for yourself and for your other teammates, but not now. It will pay off. It's like an investment for the future, for your future self, because you'll be able to maintain the logic and make changes to your code base easily. So just write unit tests. That's my advice. It's a great first step always. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's all what I prepared for today.
Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Maciej. Uh, I know there are some comments on our Facebook, so uh, afterwards you can uh, dive in and maybe respond uh, and share uh, more of your experience. And we'll be coming back to you after a short break. So once again, five minutes. And we'll be talking about uh, Redux in iOS with Pavel. So I'm going to just put up the slide uh, with, uh, with our stay tuned message. And we're going to see each other at, let's say, this. Yeah, so just let me show the screen. And we're going to see you in a few minutes.
And so it's time for our last presentation tonight. Uh, hi, Pavel, are you here? Hi, hi, how are you? Yeah, great. After seeing those two presentations, I think like I'm becoming a mobile developers developer. Uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So like uh, I, I thought about it that Camille told you how to compile and deco decompile stuff. Uh, Machi told you, showed you actually what you should avoid writing Swift apps. Uh, iOS apps, basically. I will tell you how to layer your data. So I, I can expect you'll be joining us tomorrow uh, in our team. <laughs> yeah, you, you, can, you can expect me to show up on your next grooming session. And I'm just going to, you know, talk about how to implement. Uh, yeah, I, I actually have one view in mind. So we're going to talk about that after the uh, after after today's event. But anyway, Pavel, just tell us who you are and uh, how came that you're so interested in, in uh, Redux. Yeah, so uh, I'm an iOS dev developer here, here at Allegro. Uh, occasionally I'm doing some backend work if I can. And about Redux, uh, well, uh, I was basically interested in all of the architectures that we know uh, and Redux was like another one, right? right? I believe that every iOS developer right now is kind of bored about all the iOS architectural talks. And, uh, but, but, but let me just assure you that this will not be the architecture you are thinking of. Uh, and I, I, I think that you will just get to know, know it at the end of the presentation that it's not, it's not the, the normal iOS architecture that we usually talk about. Okay, so let's, start, so, so let's hear it. Let's talk about this, you know, totally new way of building applications. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's start with what actually is Redux. So if you, it, when I started to get to know the, the whole, let's call it library. Okay. For now, uh, when you even start looking in, in Google, one thing that, that, that you will find is that it's mostly connected to web development. So it's like, it's, it's nothing that that you should try, right? It's, it's web development, it's not for iOS people. So when my, when, when my friend told me about Redux, I, I just told him, dude, it's not for us. And, and, and then he just convinced me that, you know, Redux, it's, 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 it doesn't matter that it's uh, actually a web, a web, a web framework, right? And because you know, MVC, MVVM, it wasn't invented for, especially for iOS apps. Right, it's an idea that came from other platforms. So Redux is basically the same thing. It came from like connections between re reactive programming and Flux, right? And it it's really popular in on, on web. So if it's actually mature and popular, why we shouldn't check it in on, on iOS? So if we start it's talking, basically, it's basically an, an idea that you adopt in your application. It's not a framework. It, well, it's it's in reinforced by a framework, but it's an idea in itself, no matter how you implement it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if, if we start to like talking about Redux, there's one basic idea, one basic, let's say, uh, thing that you, you, you need to keep, unidirectional data flow. So in iOS pers perspective, you, if when you have like an application, you have view, right? You see something in your app. And what you can do, let's say you can tap a button. So you're basically doing some action, right? You're emitting event. And let's say this button will randomize the background color of, your, of the view that you're right now looking at of your application. So this background color is actually state of your, of your application right now, state of the view that you're looking at. And that state will basically change. It will be randomized, right? This action will change the state. And the change of the state will change the background color of what you're seeing, right? The, the changed state will be rendered on the, on the screen, right? And this is basically normal for us. We're doing this totally. This is nothing new. We have our views, so the state, we, we can keep this data state in, this, in, in our view, close to our view. It's a view, view model, view control. I'm not judging here right now. Uh, so you're keeping the state. Sometimes maybe you're, you're not keeping the state. Maybe you, you're sure that the view will keep the state itself because it has its own properties, right? So the data state is not clearly visible. 
Uh, and and we, we have it like, you know, spread across the, uh, across the application because we have multiple views. The, there's a distribution of the state, right? And what happened next? It's like you have a new wild feature, right? Your PO comes and just tells you, well, you know, this random button is basically should actually do more. It should randomize the state in like both of these views. So then you start sharing this state, or maybe you start basically sharing some part of the state in this view, and or, or you're composing multiple states together to render something on the different view, right? And you then you actually, if, if, if the action that is triggered goes down to the stack of the views that you have, you need to really remember about communicating this and sending your state and then you create connections. So basically your state, you can define where, where exactly uh, it is right now. So if you happen, you just starting asking yourself this question, where exactly is my state? You have no idea, it's, maybe it's here, maybe it's some, someplace else, right? Uh, it's spread basically across multiple views and it's shared. So you're actually, doing something which is called shared mutable state, which is like the biggest evil of all times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But you know, when you're introducing a new feature, there's usually not much time to do it. So you do it and then you figure out how to fix it, right? And, and how, how do we do it? Well, we basically refactor, right? We split our big components into smaller ones. Maybe we connect merge. Uh, smaller components into big ones. We we try to like sometime like untangle this thing. Uh, so like 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 much 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 he told you about in the previous pre presentation. We start we start basically refactoring this stuff. And you know the other part is the communication. Like if you're starting, if you if you look at it, you you, you saw the lines, right? You need to communicate the state between many different objects. And as an iOS developer, I believe that anyone who wrote an app wondered about this. Like how, how if you have a multiple tabs, how do you like inform about the state? Well, you can use notification center. This is a very evil thing in iOS that you can do, but, but it's possible, why not? Uh, but what we do usually is, is we basically do tricks and you start with delegating stuff. Right, so let's say we have a multiple stack of views, multiple level levels of navigation, and we need to communicate them. So we start creating like a de delegate la layer that we're we're basically sending between them, and you know delegates they're basically objects like hidden behind the protocol, uh, some kind of like interface, right? So we we can create as many as we want. Right, and at the end, we, we we cannot tell which one is which, right? And and what we are sending, and then it's basically like say let, let's say that your uh, your PO comes and tells you, okay, so tell me about this logic, right? What, how do the app will behave if I do if I want you to do something like that, you know? And you, and you or if you can change this logic this way and how it will influence this uh, behavior of the application. And normally you would say, okay, you, you would look in the code. Okay, I found one code, one, let's say part of the code that changes the state. Yeah, but uh, th th this will happen, right? But you forgot about five different places where maybe the same code, maybe you have the same code doing the same thing, right? Or changing it or even if, another part of the state is influencing this thing, right? So, pro so probably during the next retro sessions, you're going to come up with, we need some kind of a documentation for our code and we need some diagrams. And then after a month, everything is obsolete. And then we start again. Yeah, exactly. So this is what, what, what I put the never ending story, right? In the previous slide, because you're basically introducing new features you're tangling your code more and more, and then you refactor, and then you tangle it again, right? This is never ending story. So what I believe is about Redux is that it can actually help you maintain these things easier. 
right? Those are the main components, well, except for the rest of the app. Uh, main components like store state reducer and dispatch, pi dispatch pipe middlewares. Those are the main components of Redux, right? And let's just explain because Redux is actually pretty easy. Like I, I had like a really hard times learning it at the beginning, but when you figure out that how it works, it's it's really easy. I know that it sounds like that with everything, right? Basically, but, riding a bike. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but really, it's it's it it doesn't those components only sound scary, but they are not really. Okay, so let let's get get through them. So what's the yeah. main benefit? So state, we discussed that the state is spread. For so for Redux, actually, there's only one to rule them all, right? you have only one state, one data structure. Let's say, let's talk details technically. Let's create a structure that will describe all of your, your whole application. So in the like previous example where I talked about application that has a button and, and the background color, background color is a state, right? So let's create a data structure with a background color and let's say button type because there was a button, right? And that's it, and you keep this. And there is nothing more. Uh, the state is just something that describes your UI and what happens, right? Uh, then you have a store, and store is kind of like a uh, let's say let's call it a component, right? It should only contain those elements. So it should contain a state data structure that we we talked about. It should contain the this this part pipe that we'll be talking about, and the reducer that we will, we will talk about. But the main thing to remember is that store is just like class, for example, that you implement and you keep those values. That's it. So when talking about dispatch pipe, you can like imagine like a normal pipe, right? So let's say the entry point for dispatch, pi dispatch pipe is a function that, take, that takes action, right? So you're emitting some, some kind of action and you have like a, function that triggers middlewares. Middlewares, spoiler alert, but we will talk about them later, but middleware is also a function. And what you need to remember is that the end of the dispatch pipe, there's a reduce, re reducer, right? So imagine that if you want to call all of the middleware that you have, you need to just basically put them on a list and call all of them one by one, right? And at the end, your, the last function that you will call will be basically a reducer. That's so it. So what is it that the middleware operates on? So what are the inputs for middleware? So if you have a, like, a, if you want to have like middleware, you're basically putting, the, as I said, like you're starting with dispatch, that you're dispatching an action. So middleware should take this action, it should take a current state of your store, right? Okay, so, so, so basically it's like a middleware operates on the current state and then the reducer does its magic, yeah? Yeah, exactly, and that makes sense because it's kept in a store, right? Next to, this, next, next to the current state. So it's easy for you to basically retrieve this state, the current state, right? And at the end, you're just calling reducer with the uh, current state, right, and, and, and action. And, and I what, guess we're gonna come up to what actually reducer in practice means and what it does. Yeah. Exactly, okay. and, and this is like one of the most important things in your application because when I told you about your logic that, that you can that your logic can be spread across the application, well, in Redux, the logic basically is only in the in the reducer. You can have more than one, right? But it's always there. And what is important about the reducer, as I said previously, it's only a function, right? It takes current state, it takes action let's say that the action will basically tell how the state uh, should change, right? So it should go into the reducer and the reducer will keep the logic. So for in, in the previous example with the background color, the action comes to change the background color, randomize it, right? And so, so the reducer will be responsible for randomizing this color and creating new background color state. And that's it. And what is very important here is that reducer should return new state. So normally I would suggest that state is immutable, right? 
and it should so so the reducer should not use the uh, current state that you have it should basically just return the new state it's like really intuitive right so if you look uh, again uh, on the previous uh, diagram it would look something like that so we have our views view controllers observers it doesn't matter they trigger action so user event doesn't matter as well so we put this action through all of our middlewares and we then trigger reducer and reducer will provide will basically provide the new state that store will replace and reactively notify all of our observers views observers notice that i'm 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 telling you that basically the, the, this architecture does not require you that does not tell you how you structure your ui ui because this is not an architecture for ui as as, as i said it's this is not mvvm you can have an mvvm application you can you can have mv uh, mvc mvvm plus co coordinators it doesn't matter really it's just a data lake right and so so let's maybe talk about uh, a bit so, in, so in, yeah. what matters is that this that the state is actually centralized it's now long it's no longer shared it's no longer mutable it's just in one place and it's immutable it's only modified by reducers yeah exactly so it, at any time of your application lifespan right you can easily just tell that yeah i have the store it keeps my current state and, and, and that's it you know that is it so and whenever you feel like it you can just yeah. prepare a state and give it to your view and every time you give the same state you're going to get the same response so it's deterministic yeah it should be of course uh, okay so let's talk in details about how we, you can do this basically like like a simple implementation so let's start with an idea of an application with spinning indicator activity indicator and, and the button right start animating and on the left side you have like a, a swift implementation so my activity indicator can animate so i should basically keep the state if is it an, if it is actually an animating and i should keep the button title because i would like to change it right if that animation stops for example or starts i should display a different title and if i want to start or stop animate uh, animation of this indicator i should send an action and this is like a scary word for this was actually a scary word, word for me because i always thought that action so it should be something actionable right but it doesn't contain any logic like for redux action is just declarative way of um, telling the store this should happen right recognize me take my data let's say because actions can actually carry some data here i used like for a simple example it's an enum right but i could for example do a more complicated network call with like query parameters and things like that right so they can carry information but the reducer is responsible for reading them and changing the state but action are actions are just declarative way of telling what is happening so, so basically it's like an event yeah, yeah. Like event yeah it, it doesn't feel like something that has to do event is like something happened and react yeah. to this yeah exactly and if you look at dispatching this action how you how you would dispatch dispatch this it's really easy as as i said like you have only a function function that takes an action and this goes through this whole pipe of middleware and it goes to a reducer reducer will basically recreate the state and that's it so this is like a very clear api for your application that you, you can easily see what's happening right and if we talk about reducer like in this example i have like main app up state reducer right so i'm reducing creating the new state uh, and i'm reducing i have like two states let's let's separate them i have button title right and i have the animation state so it requires me to basically write two different reducers, right? Uh, and I'm just reducing this, so I'm returning according to the action that was sent. I'm just returning the new state for this. And let's see, for so, example, so, so the, mm -hmm. the the term reduce 
it actually means that you're taking an event and reduce everything that it contains, like all the business logic associated with an event into a new state. And it's always reducing it just to the simple object, which is state. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if you imagine that I can have an action that doesn't concern me, right? As a reducer, I can basically, I, maybe I don't care about tapping the button, right? So if it doesn't, I'm just returning the old state because nothing has changed, right? So this is like a, the nicest part here is that the observer, right? So I'm reactively observing the state change. And by reactively here, uh, I was always like scared a bit about Eric Swift and that every that, that when everyone was talking about uh, reactively notifying and, and things like that, everyone usually had in mind that it should include, include Eric Swift or some kind of Eric's library, right? But it doesn't, right? You have one property of state, you can easily implement a did set for it and do it like nat natively with Swift. You can use the newest combined framework to, to do it like on for iOS 13. Uh, and, and, and that would work, right? So reactively it doesn't necessarily mean here, and, and I want to like point the attention here, that it doesn't mean that you need to like use some kind of reactive program. So basically in the, in the old ways, you would probably do something like if button is pressed and title is something and all the logic would go here. And with, uh, with Redux, what you're actually doing in Notify is just check the state. There's no logic associated, just do what it says. Yeah, exactly. I actually, like when I started implementing this, this really reminded me a bit about uh, graphical engines. I don't know if you're familiar, familiar with it, where you basically rendering the, before entering the screen, you're rendering every state on the protocol buffer, right? Uh, frame buffer, sorry, uh, frame buffer, where, yeah. where, you, where you keep it and then you're displaying it 60 times per second, right? It's basically the same thing. You're getting this application state in your observer and you're rendering it, that's it. And if you look at the, uh, at the, uh, at the, uh, at the Redux right, plot here, right? how it looks in the, in, in the application example. We have a view controller that is sending the action to the store, right? It, it's dispatching, it, using this dispatch function. So this dispatch function will basically call the reducers. Sorry for the lack of space. I, I, I forgot to put the third one. Uh, so it's calling the reducers. They are reducing the state and basically creating new one. Store will re replace this state and notify the controller. And the observer, you, you, you notice that how it works, it's rendering the state on the, on the UI, right? And that's it. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so somebody, somebody in the comment section uh, noticed that uh, reducer is a bit like the reduce higher order function in standard Swift library. Like it's, it's, very, it's very familiar. Yes, exactly. This is how you actually can implement it. I wanted to like tell you like, um, easiest way so uh, and, and call everything the easiest way possible but the implementation you can use for the array of functions you can basically re reduce them right and you we will see that in the in the minute right because everything works right now everyone is happy we can do static uh, applications but you know where is my data where's the data from the internet right I know there is no application that contains only static content right now. So how do I do async programming? And I don't want to tell you that, you, you know, Redux is cool, but you still need to keep your networking code inside your view controllers, right? So there's also like a component for that. And this is middleware. So middleware is, as, as I already said, it's in this dispatch pipe, right? But it contains, and it's just a function, okay? So um, it, it has one really nice functionality. It can break the dispatch pipe. So for example, if I want to do some kind of background work, so for example, download the data, I can use middleware, middleware for that because I can dispatch action 
that for this in this example search action right and i'm my middleware will notice this action before the reducer right in this dispatch pipe reducer is at the end and this is like really important because here i can break the pipe i can consume this action me as a middleware right i can start fetching the data and if the data will come right so i have a success here sorry for the failure implementation uh, <laughs> it never fails <laughs> uh, so if the data comes i can dispatch new action which actually will go to a reducer and it will for example fill some table with with view models right so it's basically like i have one event which is search and this event is uh, captured by the middleware and as soon as it's done searching, it emits a new event, which is called like, I found it. And this is what go, 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 goes to the view and to the reducers. Yeah, exactly. And the search event will never trigger the state change because it, because it never, it, it, it was never, uh, it never hit the reducer, right? So the state never changed. Uh, okay, so everything looks fine. And what are the options? Well, you have only one. There is actually a library called Reswift. It's uh, available through, I, I think, Cocoapos and Cartage. Uh, and it's just one library created by, by and the core team. And ben Benjamin Ench was actually the first person working on that. But honestly, what I talked to you about is that there's nothing to be scared, not nothing scary about Redux. And you can easily, I believe, you can easily create your own implementation. Because like there is no magic here, right? And as I started actually implementing this by my by by myself, I uh, I noticed one thing, something I always knew and ne but never realized that the whole iOS application structure is basically a tree, like a an array tree, right? Where you have a view. And each view, view controller, navigation controller, or tab bar controller, right? It can have children. So you can have n number of children in all of them. And they all can do some kind of actions. So some of them can present, some of them can contain others and can push, right? And, and that's it. But this is all you can, you need to basically recreate in the state to have a possibility to represent the whole application. And just realizing that showed me that <laughs> it's really easy to represent my application. In this example, I have tab bar that displays two tabs with both with navigation controllers, with home navigation, with, with home controller and with profile control. And that's it, this is my whole application state. And if, if, we, if we talk about, if this is my state, right? So what if I want to push, for example, what if I want to show another view controller on this, in this state, right? What if I want to like edit profile or something like that? Who should do this? And I really like coordinators. <laughs> I, I really enjoy working with them. And I really believe that th they should be responsible for basically rendering this state. Because usually if you use coordinator to Usually you would use coordinator to push something and now you have you still have your coordinator and it can basically handle the Notification about state change, right? So this is for, for me. It was like really natural Intuitive idea to, to do this and you implement it in coordinator and you can basically reuse it Right. So right now I have like a little demo application. I built for you uh, let me just. So we can see the emulator now. Uh, but really a small one, right? Yeah, the small one, yeah. Okay, uh, what about now? Now it's, now it's huge, now it's whole screen. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is the application that I built. It, 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 it basically displays the uh, list of GitHub repositories, random, let's say. Uh, and uh, I just, this is totally live demo, so I hope it will go well. Uh, if there's not much functionality, let's just look for something for 
some repository like Doom. Okay. Right. Okay. I found some some implementations of Doom. Okay. Cool. Let's maybe look for Allegro on GitHub. Ah, interesting. Right. Oh, th this there's actually one other uh, functionality. It has a paging. Right. So infinite infinite load. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. Let's, oh, let's check what, what's that. So I can display, okay, I don't know what's that. Oh, nice. Merchant support. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's go back. And this application works whole, whole on Redux, right? So why I'm showing you this is one thing. I if you already noticed, I hope you already noticed that if I, my whole application is based, based on one state and I can recreate it basically by notifying all of my observers with it. And I can, and I, I have one dispatch pipe that's basically feeding the actions and changing the state. I can keep my old state. Let's say I can create an array and I keep, I can keep all of this past states in, a, in this array. And here's what I have. So I started the app, right? And my navigation stack count was one. I had my repository state with zero repositories uh, and no phrase, I wasn't looking for anything. And then, you know, I had a response from the server with 100 repositories. Then I started to search for Doom, right? So it pushed my new uh, navigation stack, new view controller. With, with, with the search results before they came. So there's zero here. Uh, with the results, I had 30 of them. Okay, 60 because I have the page reload. Then I start looking for Allegro, right? With zero repositories, okay. Then I had like six, 30 and 60. And then, yeah, I start looking at details, right? And it's all very cool, but what for? Well, you can basically recreate the, if you have your application built on top of Redux, right? You can see everything. Like you can keep this state, for example, in your, for, your, for your user. Let's say you have a case on production where your user tells you that something doesn't work. Maybe it's a issue with, with, with profile, with, with the user profile, right? And, and the data is actually really returned badly. And you, you, you can do this because you cannot impersonate this user in production, right? You don't have this ability, but you have it, it have the whole application state stored. So why not send it and just try, try it um, in your development environment, right? You can do all of that. And so basically it's the deterministic approach. Once again, you have one source of truth and whenever you push it to the views, they should behave the same way always. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And if I have one place to store the state and I can basically feed all of my observers with the new state, I can do something like that. And I go here. Oh, and I have my details, right? I was looking for Allegro, but previously I was looking for Doom, right? So I can basically recreate every every situation in my in my application, right? So at the end of my short demo, uh, now I just need to switch sharing. Okay. We can see the small phone. So now, yeah, now the presentation is yeah. here. Yeah. So let's move to testing. Uh, as you saw, the reducer functions. Well, if they contain all the logic you need to test them right but they are really easy to test as you adam said like if you have in if you just put actions in and the current state and you know what you expect on this for this action it's really easy to test right dispatching actions well if you're sending something you should probably if you expect you're sending something you should probably test it right middleware also they are basically a pure functions that do something you, you just if, if you're using networking of course you can do like a dependency injection approach and, and mock everything right and and just check if it's called 
and you need to test your observers. So the rendering part, you need to check if it's actually renders correctly with what you're feeding. But if you know all the possibilities where your st state is, to, how your state can change, it's really easy to test. Okay, so there's there's one question uh, from our Facebook. Uh, so the question is, how about using Swift UI with Combine that is already in Swift Core and uh, which can handle state of UI and bindings between between layers? How about using it instead of uh, some third party like ResWift? Yeah, exactly. Like uh, this is what what I wanted to like want every listener to to take from this is that you can implement it by yourself. It's it's like you, you, you don't have to introduce third party libraries to do anything here because it's easy. Like Redux is easy. It's just an idea that you can implement. You can use Swift UI is basically perfect for that. It's prepared for that. But you're just basically you're observing the state that you, you have in different place, right? You don't have to keep it on view models or view controllers or whatever. And actually Swift UI has another advantage. It's a, it has env environmental vi variables. Yeah, where you can easily, without using even dependency injection, you can move your store around uh, and, and have access to it everywhere, right? Uh, so yeah, let's summarize this because the good parts about Redux is that it really separates your data layer from your whole application. This is, this is what I, I was talking about. It tells you how you should structure your data architecture, not your UI. Your UI can be anything. So you can basically, and what, what that means is that you can introduce Redux to the existing applications that have some UI architecture already, MV, MVVM, MVC. It doesn't matter. It's just you're moving away your data from your views, from your view models to, to the Redux store and you keep it there and it will work. Just start by, in, by moving one state then another, another, and bigger part, part and the bigger part, right? It's really easy. Uh, it really gives you the clear API of actions. If your whole application is described by actions, you just, let's say you put them all in one file and you have every, in one file, you have everything your, your application can do, right? It's really clear API for you. And if you're looking for something, like if you someone will ask you how, how application does that, this or that, you're just looking for an action and that's it, you have it, right? So also the state is easily, easily presented. As you had noticed already that I can stop on breakpoint in the bugger and display the state of the, let's say view that is not even on the screen anymore, right? I can basically display everything. And what it gives you, if you implement the observer, however you'd like, I already said, you can use uh, like reactive library for that. You can use combine anything, but the state propagation is for free, right? Because it's just one place of where the state is. Okay, but it okay. cannot be so perfect. So what's the yeah. bad? So uh, if you'd like to recreate the UI state, the UI kit will not be, it will not, will not, will not go easy on you. Because like, because mostly because of the animations we have on, on iOS, you know, you can cancel animation, not of, all of them have the same time of execution. So it's really hard sometimes, or it requires a boilerplate plate code, right? Writing all of the completions, complete completion blocks or other tricks like uh, queuing actions to, to basically maintain this, right? So it's not easy. Routing is always not very easy, especially if you have mm, really complex application. So I showed you this on a really small part, but I, I, I can imagine really huge applications that, that, that it would be really tricky to do. Uh, and it's really easy if you start with the existing application, it's really easy to omit some states. So, and you don't want to have the synchronized states between what you what is in your store and what is in your UI because it ends really badly. You're basically all of your application is based on the state that is in store. And if it's unsynced, then it's it's really bad. 
Uh, and what is the ugly part is the search restoration. Uh, if you really want to do this, it's still like a part of your application that needs constant maintenance, but your user users will never see it, right? So it's something that you're doing for your own. So it's really easy to drop it, right? Uh, I will do it in next release or next release or next release, right? And then everyone forgets about it. Uh, as I already mentioned, UIKit, mapping everything from UIKit on, on the store and recreating it, uh, it's really tricky. And it's often like a nesting ifs statement and, and stuff like that. Uh, and, and it's mainly mainly because of the UI kit and the, and, and the animations that, that you have there and, and all the possibilities. Uh, and as many other uh, frameworks, ideas, uh, let's say, uh, you will end up with some boilerplate code. Uh, you just need to write this. As I, as I mentioned, the completion blocks, you need to handle them. If you notice in my demo application, I had to like actually overwrite all of the bug buttons because I had to recreate the state, right? So stuff that comes normally for free won't be free again, right? You, you just need to do this. Uh, and the other thing you need to notice when I showed you the, the results, for example, for my search, uh, I had two of the same states on my stack, right? So if I'm updating the results, which one should I actually notify? Because they are both the same type of this, of this instance, right? So suddenly you need to somehow identify everything you are displaying. So it's not that easy, right? I mean, it's not that easy. You, you, you can do this, right? But you need to do this right now. You, and you, you, you never had to do it, right? So uh, in, in the comment section, Bartos just noticed that well, uh, handling uh, custom animations, just as you said, is not a is not especially uh, nice thing, and it's not really easy to do. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy to even without Redux. So with Redux, it's just you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and that's that's all I have. Yeah. So thanks. Okay, so thank you, Pavel. Uh, so there's been some discussion in comments, uh, as we noticed. But uh, so if you if you want to uh, if you want to reply to some of them after the session, uh, you're more than welcome to. And uh, that would be all for tonight. So thank you all for tuning in for listening to Allegro Tech Live number five. Uh, it was all about iOS programming. I hope you liked it. Uh, thanks to Camille, to Maciej and to Pavel for presenting uh, to us, for sharing their knowledge. <laughs> uh, and um, just uh, go to our webpage, go to allegro.tech, find our job postings. Maybe there's something interesting for you in there. Uh, and also subscribe to our podcast. As I said, the iOS, uh, the iOS one is going to come out really soon. And uh, have a great night and stay safe and uh, see you on the next Allegro Tech Lives, uh, the mobile editions probably. So thanks a lot and good night. <laughs>